Welcome. So uh, welcome to Black Homesteaders of the South, which is going to be presented by Bernice Alexander Bennett, the author of Black Homesteaders of the South. Um, she's going to uh, cover basically today the process, the procedure, the types of research, the types of documents in depth for us and talk a little bit about writing the book. Um, very excited to have her. Uh, the way that we will structure the program today is uh, Bernice will present, and then at the end of her presentation, I will open up chat and hands for questions. We'll have about 10 to 15 minutes for questions. So um, if you do think of something during the chat, I mean, during the presentation, you're welcome to type it in chat, and I will reserve it to read at the end during the Q&A session, okay? And then another good thing about this presentation is we are recording it. We'll be putting it up on YouTube later this month. And then I think lastly, it's important to note that uh, we will be continuing this discussion on the 18th with a panelist of some of the Louisiana descendants uh, that contributed to uh, the book and that Bernice worked with. Okay. And um, Bernice, if you would like to introduce yourself and uh, get us started, I will continue to let people in in the background. Okay, well, I'm just going to say hello to everyone. I'm, I will stop my video, but I want to thank everyone for coming in today to listen to this session, and I'll, I'll just get started. So, yes, the stories that we will talk about are untold stories of Black homesteaders. And I'm excited to share this book and to share this research is because this book was written with descendants. Descendants created this book is what I want to say. They were a part of the process from the very beginning. And the Black homesteaders of the South tell stories of resilience and celebrates individuals, some of whom were formerly enslaved, but were able after their emancipation to obtain up to 160 acres of public land under the Homestead Act of 1862. I mean, can you imagine when you hear that number, what we're talking about? So what I will do is to provide you, as Amanda mentioned, an overview of what is the Homestead Act of 1862, what are the eligibility requirements, the application process, what is a land patent, what you can learn from land entry papers, and then I will share a few untold stories. So just take a look at this poster. This poster was produced back in 2012, and it commemorated the Homestead Act of 1862, 150th anniversary. If you look at the top of this poster, what do you see? Free land, millions of acres of land, free land. But if you look further down, you will see this African-American family in the middle, and then the words American dream. Well, what do you think the American dream meant to this family or other families? that applied for this land. Education, yes, we wanted the right to education, the right to vote, work for wages, religious freedom, safety, and yes, land and home ownership. So as one of my genie friends wrote, he made this statement and he put it on, on Amazon. You know, as Black Americans research and follow their ancestors' paper trails, they further verify that they were resilient and resourceful people against all odds, documenting land ownership under the Homestead Act of 1862 is an excellent piece of family history. It is not just the valuable genealogical and community information it may contain, it can also show the trials 
and tribulations involved in obtaining and keeping the land. So let me give you an overview of the Homestead Act of 1862. This act was signed by President Abraham Lincoln, May 20th, 1862, and it went into effect January 1st, 1863. In fact, the first homesteader was named Daniel Friedman, and he obtained his land in Beatrice, Nebraska. In fact, when I talk about the Homestead Act, I want you all to understand the cry at that time was, let's move west. There was a lot of public land, land that had actually come from the indigenous populations through treaties and what have you. And this land was available. This public land was out there. But the original act that was signed on May 20th, 1862 had certain stipulations. The individual had to be head of the family and over the age of 21. They could never take up arms against the United States. Single women, widows, immigrants, and later former slaves could apply for this land. Now to actually get this land, there was another process. They had to settle on the land. They had to file an application and pay a small filing fee. They had to cultivate, improve, and live on the land for a minimum of five years. They had to bring witnesses and post the intentions in the newspaper and then file for a deed of title and pay another small fee. One thing I want you all to understand, what this process entailed was for everyone. There wasn't a special process for African-Americans and whites. Everyone did the exact same thing. In fact, none of the applications had the word or even designated whether it was a woman or a man or black or white. So understand we're all going through the exact same process. But there's one thing to keep in mind. When this act was passed in 1862, what was going on everyone? That's right, the Civil War. And in fact, during the Civil War, most African-Americans were not considered citizens. So let's move forward because there were several reconstruction amendments that took place between 1865 and 1870, of which I've listed, 13th, the 14th, and the 15th Amendment. We also had the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen and Abandoned Lands. And they actually administered some of that land that was abandoned. And this was established uh, in 1865 to assist in the reconstruction of the South to aid formerly enslaved individuals transition from freedom to citizenship. And if any of you have ever spent time looking at these records, you will find there's records included information about food rations. There, was, there were letters, uh, a, apprenticeships. Uh, you also had labor contracts. So you had a lot going on during this period of time. But you also had an, another act called the Southern Homestead Act. And it went into effect June 21st, 1866. So I mentioned you had the Freedmen Bureau that went into effect in 1865. Now you have the Southern Homestead Act. And that opened up about 46 million acres of land. Now, when I mentioned the Homestead Act of 1862, I said 160 acres were available. Well, with the Homestead Act, the Southern Homestead Act, we're looking at 80 acres of land. And that land was available in Louisiana, Mississippi, Arkansas, Florida, and Alabama. 
Now, the problem with this act, unfortunately, is that it was poorly administered. You didn't have land offices, and there was just a lot of bureaucracy and just problems with this act. And so it was appealed July 4th, 1876. In fact, I looked at the newspaper. This is a Times-Picayune newspaper dated uh, the 6th of October, 1866. And this newspaper actually had instruction in it about the Southern Homestead Act. And when they talked about this act, they allowed people to pay just a $5 filing fee. And they also extended this act. It's actually in the act that it was extended to all citizens of the United States without distinction as a race or color. And this was in the Times Picayune. There was also another entry in the paper, and I wanted to just get an idea if they would say something about the Southern Homestead Act in Louisiana. And what I read in this particular newspaper, which was the New Orleans Daily Democrat, it stated there were no entries in the Southern states until 1866, and in Louisiana, not until 1867 on account of the war. So that's interesting. You know, when we talk about this Homestead Act and then you see there were no entries until 1867, we're really going to start seeing, well, what was going on? Well, I want to go back for a minute to the Freedmen Bureau because the Freedmen Bureau was actually administering this abandoned land. And one of the sources that many of you may find is that your ancestors were on a labor contract. Well, certainly my ancestor was on a labor contract. His name was Peter Clark. And Peter is on this labor contract with his family. And this was the Cox Plantation in Livingston Parish. I'm telling you that because you want to try to put as many primary documents as possible at your disposal so that when you're ready to tell a story about your ancestor, of course, I, I look at my ancestor and I said from, you know, from slavery to land ownership. Well, how can I tell that story without finding the primary documents? Also, we want to understand during this period, there was this whole sharecropping system. Folks were not owning land, but sharecropping during that period of time was a legal arrangement where the landowners would allow a tenant to use the land in return for a share of the crops. But, you know, was this ideal? Did this really have the impact of land ownership? And I would say no. But let's take a look at this map for a minute. This map represents all of the public land states in the United States. That means that any of these states in brown, these are places where you should be looking for your homesteading ancestor. If the state is till, that's not a homestead state, that's not public land. Now they may have had other land, bounty land or other types of land, but it was not homestead land. And I have often been asked, well, what about Georgia? What about South Carolina? No, those were not the public land states where individuals could get up to 160 acres of land. So let me take you to another project. And this is a project, and this is how I got involved with the book the Black Homesteaders Project of the Homestead National Historical Park. The Black Homesteader Program or project really was designed 
to help tell the stories of Black homesteaders from the Great Plains. And documentation has been gathered for quite a while from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln on the Black colonies that were out in the Great Plains. And those colonies where there's a statement here that the promise of land brought homesteaders across the nation. Many Black homesteaders came in groups or colonies, and they created all Black or mostly Black self-governing rural communities. Well, I got involved in this project because they wanted, when I say they, the National Homestead Historical Park wanted to encourage individuals from all the 30 states to identify their homesteading ancestor and to tell their stories. So let me just tell you who the Black homesteaders are. Now, these are individuals that applied for and received a patent for up to 160 acres of land under the Homestead Act. They were all head of households and over the age of 21. There were men, single women and widows. Some were free people of color. Some were formerly enslaved and some were former members of the United States colored troops. And you'll see that in the stories. But what did it really take? You know, in order for you to get this land, I don't care what you want to say. Yes, the land was free, but you still needed money. You needed some resources. You needed money for farm tools. You needed money for seeds and livestock. You needed money just to pay that small little filing fee, not to mention transportation. And you know why you needed transportation? Because you had to go to a land office meaning you had to travel there and you had to have money to get you there. You also had to have other resources and that came under the heading of skills. Skills in agriculture, farming skills. Can you imagine applying for 160 acres of land and having no skills, no knowledge of agriculture, animal husbandry, carpentry, nothing? You wouldn't make it very long. You also needed community support and witnesses and other people to help you. Can you imagine one person clearing 160 acres of land? I can't even imagine that. I can't even imagine clearing six acres of land. But let's take it to another level because I mentioned land patents. I mean, that was the ultimate goal and the patents are the legal documents that transferred the land from the United States government to individuals. That's our ultimate goal, to get that land transferred to us. And this is what an original land patent looked like. I mentioned the Freedmen Bureau record that my ancestor, Peter Clark, was on that Freedmen Bureau record. Well, this is Peter Clark's original land patent that he acquired in 1896. So how do you know and how can you find out if your ancestors own land? Well, this is a resource that all of you should be aware of, and that's called the Bureau of Land Management. By going to the Bureau of Land Management, you can search to determine if your ancestor owned land. And this is what the search pulled up for me. Here his name is, Peter Clark. He received his land in 1896. This is his document number. I know it's Louisiana. If I go straight across, I know it's Livingston Parish where my ancestor lived. All of you could do this exact same thing. Then this is the information that came up. Okay, he's in the state of Louisiana. There's his name. 
He went to the land office in New Orleans. So you have to know the land office when you are requesting your land file. I know that this was under the Homestead Act of 1862. Why? Because here it is listed. These are the documents and then the amount of land he acquired a total acreage, 159.33 acres of land. Now, can you just imagine somebody that was on a labor contract in 1868 is now showing up as a homesteader in 18. 96. You know, I am just happy dancing all over the place. And this is what Peter Clark's land patent looked like on the Bureau of Land Management. So you'll see that land patent. I showed you the original, but this is what you will see on the Bureau of Land Management. And this is Peter Clark, my great great grandfather, with his son. Moses. And not only will you find the land patent, you will also find the track book. And here's Peter Clark's name in the track book, along with other folks in Livingston Parish, Louisiana. So you think you're finished now that you found the land patent? No. Not at all. You need to find the land entry case files. And this is where the fun begins. Because if you find that your ancestor owned land, we're going to go to the beginning of the process. The land patent is the end of the process. And those land entry case files are at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. The files cost $50. It's worth every penny. And these boxes right here are all out of St. Landry Parish. And you can see they went to the land office in New Orleans. So it says land entry case files, record group 49, records of the Bureau of Land Management. We are getting ready to go into primary documents. So what can you find in the case file? Well, all of this information that I have, the settler's name, when he was born, his age, when he settled on the land, where the land is located, how much he paid and when, uh, what improvements he made, how many people lived in the house, you know, did he sign with an X or his signature? Who were the witnesses? When did uh, he, she obtain the land patent and the number of acres? All of this you will find in the application process. So let's talk specifically about Louisiana and the Black homesteaders. The Homestead National Historical Park Service documented that there are 29,988 homesteads in Louisiana. That represents 9% of the land acquired out of a total of, let's say, 2 million acreages available. In the Black Homesteaders of the South book, we have 18 landowner stories from nine parishes, Ascension, Bossier, East Baton Rouge, East Feliciana, Livingston, St. Helena, Washington, West Feliciana, and Claiborne Parish. And I can tell you folks, there are a lot more stories. I am sitting on at least 20 land entry case files, stories that I need to continue to write. But I just want you all to know when you pick up this book, you have stories from Louisiana in this book. By the way, there are also stories in the book from Alabama, Arkansas, Florida, Mississippi, and of course, I said Louisiana. Now, there are land offices that individuals had to go to. 
New Orleans, Natchitoches, East Baton Rouge, Greensburg, and even more. But those are just some of the land offices that are documented in the book. And these are the names of the individuals where the stories have been written by the descendants. So let me walk you through a couple of land entry case files. So this file is for a man named Labrum Brock. Labrum has mentioned that he is 26 years old. He's pretty young. And that he was a farmer and self-employed. Uh, he lived in Dillon's, Mississippi. And he applied on the 22nd of September, 1884. And he lived with a man named William Brock in Mississippi. And he states that he is a native born citizen of the United States. I mean, I, how would you know this other than to have this primary document? And he's telling people this is the information. He also is describing when he first resided on made improvements and the value of those improvements. So he resided on this land the 1st of January, 1885. He built a dwelling house, a smokehouse, a crib and stable. He cleared and fenced about four acres of land for six seasons. He valued this at $150. And there's even more that he's saying. So remember I mentioned he needed to have witnesses. By the way, uh, he applied for this land in Washington Parish. Uh, his witnesses were Josiah Broomfield, Willis Broomfield, Jordan Lee, and Green Andrews. So now you get an idea of who's in his universe, who's part of his, his family grouping or his fan club. It's whatever you want to call it. But this is his community. And I mentioned to you all, you needed to have witnesses. And these are the people that will go to the land office and attest to the fact that you did what you were supposed to do. So he named his witnesses. And we're now in 1889. So this is the story that was written by one of the descendants. And this story is on the National Park Service website. I wanted to point out one thing to you because it was in his file that he lived with William Brock in Mississippi. And the descendant that wrote this wrote, he soon moved out of his family home and he indicated in his homestead application that he lived with William Brock in Mississippi before making his claim. This may have been William Brock, a white man living in Pike County, Mississippi at the time. It is likely that William Brock was related to or was himself the enslaver of Laban's family. Now, this is a whole story, but I'm just showing you an excerpt so that when individuals were asked to write their stories, they also were asked to submit their stories for publication on the National Park Service website. Now, this is another website and it's called History Geo. And I put this site up here because I wanted you to see Labrum Brock's land and some of his witnesses and where they were located. So you now have a couple of resources to be aware of. The Bureau of Land Management is one. The second is the land entry papers. And now you have History Geo, to see exactly where that land is located. And History Geo documented what they call the first land owners. How exciting. So let me take you to another file. And this is in St. Tammany Parish. I bet you we may even have some descendants of Josiah Cyprian here. 
While he was 60 years old when he applied for this land, he stated that he was born in St. Tammany Parish and that he applied at the land office in New Orleans. He built a house in 1897 and he established actual residence at that time. His residence included, he built a log dwelling house, a barn, a stable. He valued it at $200. He cleared 18 acres. He said he lived with his wife and 10 children. And when you talk, they ask the question, what kind of land was this kind of describing? He put piney woods most suitable for farming. Now I can tell you right now, how would you know about his house? And when he built his house, if you did not have this testimony of the claimant telling you that, we now have some information on Josiah. You know, I mentioned to you that he had to have a filing fee. Well, here it is. Here he put in $6 and for 40 point. 44 acres. That was his filing fee. And then he had to name witnesses. Look at the witnesses. B. Neal, Emil Baham, Robert Brown, Tom Cipron. All of these witnesses are here and you will see something else in the name of the register. But I also mentioned to you that he had to post proof in the newspaper. So yes, you will find the actual newspaper clipping of your ancestor in those land entry case files. I know I was just excited to see the name in the newspaper of my ancestor, but this is what that clipping looks like. How many of you may even know who B. B Neal or Emil Baham or Robert Brown or Tom Cyprian? How many of you may even have heard of these names? But look at the register. His name is Walter L. Cohen. And yes, he was an African-American Republican and he was appointed as the register of land of the land office in New Orleans. And his name is on a large number of documents in this file. And we're now in 1903. And so here we are now at the final proof. I mean, he is almost finished. This is December 21st, 1903. I can tell you folks that when you're going through these land entry case files, you can put together a total timeline of what's happening to your ancestors. So when you hear, let's say that the 1890 census was burned, go get your land entry papers because you may see your ancestor was right in a certain place in 1890 because you have it. Well, this is the story that I wrote about Josiah. Remember I told you all that sometimes individuals were former members of the United States Colored Troops? Well, I pulled the invalid pension file for Josiah because I wanted to get just a full picture of who he was. And yes, he stated around the age of 18 or 20, he enlisted on August 17, 1864 in Company G, 10th Regiment of the United States Colored Heavy Artillery Volunteers at the Two Row Building in New Orleans. Yes, it was right there in his file. He also stated he was born on the Henry Cooper Plantation, on the Chifuncta River, about 15 miles near Madisonville in St. Tammany Parish, Louisiana in 1840. I have this big, big pension file and I also have his land entry papers. I would like to totally give this to the descendants of Josiah. 
because this is history in the making. He is telling his story and I helped him tell it too. And so when I went to history, Geo, here he is, here's his land. Look at Emil Baham. In fact, there's several Bahams here and there's several Cyprians also owning land in this parish. So excited. Well, this is another story. And this is a story that was written by Felix Scott Jr. And I think Felix is, is probably listening to us because I mean, how proud can you be of your ancestor that owned land? And his name was George Paysinger. Now this is the notice that was put in the paper for George Paysinger. February 10th, 1880. This is his notice of publication, the land office in Natchitoches. And remember, I did mention several different land offices. So this is another land office that he went to. And so when he passed away, his, there was a notice in the paper about George Paysinger. He died near Roberta on the ninth, age 86 years old. Now, according to this newspaper article, he was born in Houston County, Georgia, although I've seen other places in Newberry, South Carolina has been mentioned. But he was brought to Louisiana as the property of Hamater and Hodges by Gideon Allen during 1845. As a slave, he was humble and industrious. As a freedman, intelligent and upright. He was also, folks, a homesteader. And here is George Paysinger's land. I mean, I, you can't get any better than this. When you start studying these homesteaders, and you start looking at their whole history and you find these primary documents. And here he is on History Geo, History Geo as a first land owner. So I'm really going to conclude because I want to open it up for questions by sharing with you all of the descendants that have contributed to the Black Homesteaders of the South book. And next week, you will have an opportunity to talk to these descendants. I'm a descendant and you have other descendants that will share with you their journey to find their Black homesteader. I also want to encourage all of you to join the descendants of African Americans Homesteaders Facebook group. We have over 300 individuals that are part of this group. The goal is to encourage you to get your land entry papers and to tell your stories, not just of the South, but tell your stories throughout these 30 homestead states. You owe this to your ancestors to tell their stories and then to write your homestead story. As I said, I'm sitting on a lot of land entry case files. I have even more stories I need to write, but I also want to encourage you to don't let anybody tell you that you didn't get land. Go look for your land, find it, tell your stories, find out what happened to that land, but at least honor your ancestors by searching for your land entry papers and your land owning ancestors. I wanna thank you all very much for listening and I look forward to answering any and all of your questions. Thank you. Oh, that was excellent. Thank you so much, Bernice. Um, I wrote down a lot of notes and I got to share a lot of um, links I'm, I'd like to put together. Thank you. Um, 
Well, we have had a couple of questions. I will I will go back and ask some of the first ones, and I'll also like go over um, some of the links again. Which, again, y'all, those are those are in um, the chat, which you can copy and paste somewhere, if if that's helpful. Um, but let's see here. So, one of the first things um, I know that. Let's see here. Where was it? It was Cheryl Montgomery. I am scrolling to you. Ah, uh, yes. So Cheryl, Mon and, and y'all, please continue to ask questions in chat, or you can raise your hand and I will try to um, unmute you in order. Um, Cheryl Montgomery says, have you seen any records from Lafayette Parish? My four times great grandfather had 630 arpents of land in Lafayette where he testified in 1812 when Louisiana became a state that he owned the land from a land grant. How would I find original papers from this? This sounds like this is Spanish or, or French. Yes, it, do, it does sound like that. And it wouldn't be part of this group of land uh, records that we're talking about because we're talking about 1862 and on, and you're going more into the colonial records. And yes, it, it would be another grouping of documents that you would look into. Right. Um, so I just want to shore that up with, um, if you go to the Family Search Wiki, they have a guide on Spanish and French land grants and where to find that information. Um, there are, of course, um, many, many places. There are some things on Family Search, of course, which again, if y'all aren't members of Family Search, just sign up for it. It's free. It's an incredible resource. But you can always go to familysearch.org slash wiki to look up stuff like this. But also, if you want to uh, do that, I would Google French and Spanish land grants Louisiana, and you'll get to a couple of resources like LA Colonial Docs. Um, and uh, did you have anything else to add? Sorry. <laughs> no, that's nothing else to add. Okay. And then here, let's see what we have next. Um, Jerry Bell has um, an observation. This is helpful. Um, if you can establish an ancestor's enlistment in the U.S., um, the colored uh, troops, in addition to pension files, you may also be able to find his uh, military service records online. The U.S. Army records were unevenly kept, but some service records have a lot of good information and background on them. Uh, what I would recommend for that is either um, Fold 3, which you can get access to through a Jefferson, St. Tammany, East Baton Rouge, or New Orleans library card. Um, that's the Fold 3 database. And then also um, uh, the, the records are actually indexed uh, on, on the NARA.gov website, which we uh, mentioned a little later. One of the things that I did not mention, and I did say that the land entry case files were available at NARA. Mm -hmm. Those records, Louisiana records, have not been digitized. Right. And when you request a record, you are requesting your original records, but you must know the land office and you must know, or you must have information, the patent information, which is one of the Bureau of Land Management forms that I shared with you. And it gave the document number and it also gave the, the land office. That's how you get your records. And I, I, you know, I'm gonna put it out. I, I, I would love to see some money made available so that we could get everybody their records free. But right now they're $50, but it's worth it. It's worth every penny folks to get your land entry case files. I, I just dropped those links in there again for everyone. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, Shelly Murphy shares a helpful link. Um, this site mapped the field offices of the Freedmen's Bureau. So I'll drop that back in chat again for everyone. Um, and that and that was, uh, I believe, um, let's see, that was mapping the Freedmen's Bureau.com. And, and I then, want to mention, since you, you mentioned uh, Shelly Murphy, Shelly Murphy is also a descendant of a homesteader from Michigan. Okay, so you know we talk we talk about you have thirty states. So she's a home uh, descendant from Michigan, and they're descendants from Oklahoma, 
Arizona. I mean, we need to see those descendants go out there. Don't let anybody tell you that no, Black people did not get land. I mean, I, I want to just keep saying it over and over again. Look for it. If you don't, then you're not doing your ancestors a good service. <laughs> you know, you need to look for that land. There, there have been so many records created by humans, even in just America, that nobody can definitively say what does and doesn't exist. It's good to get to those primary sources and search anyway. Absolutely. And the, and the, the primary is, is telling you something that you would not have known. You know, you would not have known how many acres they cleared, for how many seasons, for how many people were there to help them, the role that those witnesses played. And one of the things that I have observed is that some of those witnesses are also Black homesteaders. So you, you'll just start studying. You study one witness, you study another witness. And I have even seen a whole group of witnesses, children marry each other. So you talk about promoting this whole generational wealth. Well, the ch if the children are marrying each other, even if they lose the land, they still have moved a step further with their family members. That is excellent advice. Um, I mean, we, we see that a lot in just general genealogy research. Like if you're having trouble finding a family, try to find their siblings, try to find their relatives and follow them. And maybe you'll reconnect with the family again, or you'll reconnect with other people that like people, you know, are looking for. Um, Catherine Labatt noted, my husband and I saw Roy Saperin last night. My husband says his people come from St. Tammany Parish. Don't know if he is a descendant of Josiah, but maybe. Well, one of the things, Catherine, I want you to know is that I have five Cyprian family records. So <laughs> they need to call me. Okay, Catherine. Um, Bernice's, um, so in our Facebook post on the City Archives website, we've shared Bernice's um, uh, Facebook page. Uh, I also shared the Facebook group link here. Let me just share that one more time. I recommend, because you'll be in the Facebook group for sure, right, Bernice? Of course. <laughs> yes. And um, so there, there, those two ways. And then, you know, I, it's entirely up to you if you want to share your email directly in the chat. But if, if not, you know, like these are great ways to contact her. Um, let's see here. Um, what's next? Um, Oh, Catherine Labatt says also, what was the second site that you told us about? Thank you, Bernice. So it was the <laughs> government land records and then History Geo. History Geo. History, I mean, it is a subscription, mm. um, just like Ancestry, what have you, but it is it is worth it to go in and at least look at your first landowner because you can put in their names. And as you saw, they did show exactly where the land was located. And then we have a lot of excellent thanks, lots of excellent presentations. Can't thank you so much. Um, they appreciate the overview of your research and the book. It makes it anyone easy for anyone to get into writing their ancestors back into history, which is an excellent way to think of it. This is so important. Thank you, Bernice. And then more excellent presentation. And then uh, let's see here. Uh, Ellen Fernandez Sacco says, you mentioned LA land records as not digitized. Is there a rough percentage of how many land records are digitized? The, the digitized records are more from the Great Plains. Hmm. And I don't, I can't tell you exactly the percentage, but I do know that's where they started the digitization process first. Mm -hmm. Okay. Definitely not in the South, though. Our records have not been digitized. <laughs> um, it's a movement. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I, it, for sure. Um, let's see. How long, uh, Shelly Murphy asks, how long is NARA, th that meaning the National Archives, taking to return the land patent package once ordered? The land entry case files, it could take from four to six weeks. However, if you, if you submit your information, just let me know and I'll talk to Nara. Got the hookup. 
I needed a drink of water and I made myself cough with it. Sorry, y'all. Um, okay, and then let's see here. That is excellent information. Um, Mary Kay says, thank you for the presentation, Bernice. I get more and more inspired to tell my ancestors stories when I hear your presentation. And then um, Suzanne Boykin says, once you know your ancestor had a land grant, oh, she asks, Again, how do you apply to the U.S. government for your ancestors file? And that's through NARA.gov, correct? That's correct. If you have your Bureau of Land Management information, you know the land office, you need the document number, and then you apply it through NARA, yes. Yeah, let me see if I can get the direct link for that really quick. Would that be under um, research uh, records? Right, mm-hmm. And then there's also contact us in the upper corner. Here's the contact us direct link. I'll put that in chat. That seems like the most expedient way to get to the right thing. Um, and then uh, Kate Himes says, looking forward to next week. Lots of great info. And then we, and then um, if I've missed anybody, please go ahead and put your question in now. And then if not, I want to, once again, let's promote next week. We'll be together for even more in-depth question and panel discussion with Louisiana and Southern Descendants and Bernice. I just want to know one thing. Do we have any descendants of homesteaders here? <laughs> Please, um, here, I'll, I'll make it so you can also unmute yourself if you're more comfortable just speaking. Um, you can click on your little Oh, there we go. Yep. Oh, yep. There's Christopher Doss. There's that's my husband. <laughs> Let me expose him. Um, Esseline, Crystal does. She is driving. Be careful, Crystal. Yeah. And then um, Margot, please feel free to unmute yourself and uh, Mary Kay as well. Or, or you're raising your hand. Yes, yes. So Margo and Mary Kay do. Yes. And Shelly. Oh, this is amazing. Jackie, this is great. How do you sign up for next week's presentation? Esteline, you should actually already be signed up for it if you signed up for this one. I'll resend the registration email on Friday and Saturday morning. So just keep an eye for that. And you can just click the same, the link that way. Yeah. And I'm seeing some people saying, yes, yes, this is absolutely wonderful. If you have not written your story, if your story is not in the book, please consider writing your story. Uh, there is a guide to how to write your story, how to go through your land entry case files. Please do that uh, because we want to see as many stories as possible. Again, these are primary sources. We're not taking some historian's words to say, no, we didn't own land, no. We want you to prove that you own land. <laughs> this is great, okay. And I see Suzanne, if Suzanne has a question. <laughs> Sorry, Suzanne, to put you on the spot. <laughs> Yeah, well, I had a, I had a, a, a an a ancestor, but it, it was before 1862. It was a, around 1840 uh, something. But she had uh, um, a land grant uh, in, through the Opelousas office. She received her land in 1842. It was around that time. Well, she she had it, it. It was on a website like what you said, land land management. Uh, she had applied for it now, um, and uh, then the other stuff happened. But I don't want to get into all of that. I don't. I, in other words, I don't know what happened to the land, but her name was on there. So, uh, so that's why I would like to see if I could send. Right. If her if her if her name is on the Bureau of Land Management. You yeah. still should be able to find some paperwork because I've had others to uh, send me information. I think one, um, I'm trying to think of the names, but anyway, it was out of East Feliciana Parish and I found two, uh, two documents at the National Archives. It wasn't Homestead land, 
but it was some other kind of land, but the documents were at the National Archives. And the person incorporated those two documents into her land uh, story. Well, this was a Boyle's Parish. A Boyle's, uh, uh -huh. a Boyle's Parish. And uh, what did I say? I said, I was, I think it was Lafayette, but it, 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 it's none of the land offices that you had listed. Right, but that was just an example of the land offices. The land offices are at different places, yes. Right, right, right. Please right, follow right. up with me. Yeah, yeah. Um, you can send me an email directly, Suzanne, and I'll get you in contact with Bernice, or um, I'm plugging the Facebook group again. Um, here's my email. And um, actually, uh, uh, somebody had one last related question. Um, so I can so I can release you in a moment, Bernice. But um, how do you get re records for ancestors who filed but didn't finish their claim? Yes, you can also request uh, those files. Just make sure when you make the request, you state that uh, was it a it, maybe it was an abandoned document or something else. Because I found one of those too, where my ancestor uh, apply and then some kind of way abandon it but there was still some paperwork there. Right. So find out what happened and it was swampland. I mean, that's why they ended up not getting it. Right, right. Um, Margo did also note um, in response to Suzanne, there was a land act in 1842 and those applicants are included on the homestead page, which I believe is the gloRecords.blm.gov website that which was the first link we've been sharing. So check that out, Suzanne. And also again, please feel free to to email us. And then um, I think uh, we're, we're going to close up soon, but uh, Susan Barrett-Smith has noted that the Louisiana State Land Off has a great research site, which that would be helpful for you too, Suzanne Boykins. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's the last link in chat currently. And then I will also throw my email in there. If you'd like to get in contact with Bernice, you can find her in the Facebook group, find her on Facebook on her page, and uh, you can email me and I'll put you guys in direct contact. Mm -hmm. Not and the Louisiana me. office, I found, I mean, the track book, I found that on that website you mentioned, Louisiana. Mm, yes. Okay, great. Perfect. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the crazy, yeah. Um, so that link that Susan has put in there, it does really look like that. There's not a dot between the WWW and the SLODMS. You're not, you're not, um, losing your mind that that is the only web web address I've ever seen that looks like that <laughs> but they got it <laughs> and it, I mean it works I found yeah you know, it works it's very helpful yes. mm -hmm. excellent well once again, um, thank you all for coming to this City Archives program. I want to thank the friends of the New Orleans Public Library for helping make this happen. Um, they are great friends to New Orleans Public Library and our programming. And uh, anytime you need to um, uh, email us or anything like that, lastly, uh, here's the archives, uh, the City Archives website. That's it, archives.nolalibrary.org. Um, Hey, uh, Doris Johnson, we'll see. If they offer institutional subscriptions like that, we will certainly inquire. Um, History Geo, I will, I will ask um, our acquisitions department if that is something they offer. Historygeo.com. Okay, and pick up your copy of the Black Homesteaders yes. of the South. <laughs> Yes, pick up your copy of Black Homesteaders of the South. It's in the catalog. It's available for sale on Amazon and on Bernice's website. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Bernice. And don't forget to come next week, everybody. We can do more questions and more discussion then too. It'll be, it'll be a great time. Thank you, Bernice. Thank you for everything. This has been so, it's so clear. It's so concise. It has all the big resources. You've done so much incredible work. I mean, really like exposing this. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you guys. Bye -bye. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.